Well, while everyone's signing in, Linda, did you want to just share with the people who just joined us? There's some great resource books. If you're a geologist like we are, you're going to really love the trip today to Hawaii. It's an active hotspot. Uh, there's a fellow named Chuck Play who we had an opportunity to go on a field trip with, and uh, Robert Siemens, his co-author, have put together a really nice book. They do tours uh, for groups in Hawaii, and they're both geologists. So just for the people joining, uh, we went to Hawaii on an AAPG Foundation meeting invitation. It wasn't an APG meeting, you know, like the ACE meetings or the ICE meetings, but we did stay a couple of days later to go investigate the Big Island, and we had never been to the Big Island before this trip, so we really loved it. In fact, it's hard to say you have a favorite Hawaiian island. This is If you ever go there, you're going to love this island. Half of it is dry and half of it is rainy. It has, it has like several big volcanoes on it. The, the active one is called Mauna Loa, and the inactive one is called Mauna Kea. And then there's a crater that's belching lava called Kilauea. And I'm not good with Hawaiian names at all. We're going to mangle those pretty bad during during this show. But uh, there's a lot to see that, and do on the island. And it's one of the less inhabited islands because the one everyone knows, the one where Honolulu is, that's uh, the island of Hawaii. Oahu, that's the island of Oahu. That's where most of the population is. That's where people often fly into. You fly into uh, Honolulu. So you take another plane to go to the biggest island called the Big Island. And, that, and that's what we did. We'd also been to Hawaii on a cruise, but we never got to the Big Island, or I don't remember it on, on the cruise. And we, we went to Maui one time. So, you know, Hawaii is a great treasure for the U.S. to have acquired this. Uh, you know, it's, it, it's, it's a really wonderful place. Right now, I don't know the status of taking a vacation there. The last time I heard, Hawaii was only letting uh, people who live there go back to their homes that you had a 14 day quarantine. If you were a traveler, I do, I haven't checked to what it is, but someday life will go back to normal here and everybody will be able to take a vacation to Hawaii. So where, what are we doing on time now? Time to go. Okay. I think it's time to start field trip Friday. We're at 54 and we had some last minute people that wanted to get in. Hopefully our people will be uh, joining us shortly. So we're going to roll some footage here. It's the beautiful Big Island of Hawaii. First thing you notice is the black rocks. Some of the beaches are black sand, and some of the beaches are white sand because of the coral that are associated. So here's a topographic map of the island of Hawaii. And my cursor, we're going to be looking at this island, the Big Island. And I think... Uh, this is Kauai back here, and Oahu's in here. And so the, what you see on top of the water are just the tips of these old volcanic islands. And uh, this one has uh, two, two ones. We're, this is Mauna Kea, and this is Mauna Loa. And we'll get into more topographic map detail later. But Charles wanted to talk a little bit about the, his, the geologic history. So we thought... As we, we're going to do a, a really exciting helicopter ride here momentarily. We thought it'd be good to give everybody a little background. So here's, uh, since we're geologists, it's always good to look at the plate tectonics. So if you see the cursor wiggling, that's where Hawaii is, very um, distant from most coastlines. In fact, it's uh, uh, about 4,000 miles from coastlines. So very isolated island chain. And if you notice, the archipelago... The Hawaiian archipelago stretches to the west-northwest and takes a really sharp bend in what is known as the Emperor Seamounts. And then it's the uh, trailing edge of a hotspot. So what we're going to look at today is we're, look, we're going where the action is. We're going to the true hotspot, uh, which is forming islands. As plates move over the hotspot, there's relict islands. And so the few in the Hawaiian area are still above water mostly. But as you go farther and back in time, this whole chain is about 3,900 miles, and it's about 80 million years of movement over the hotspot. And this very abrupt 120 degree angle, very abrupt change here, uh, happened about 40 million years ago. 
And a lot of the islands that have weathered and subsided that were uh, previous volcanoes have carbonates built on them. So it's a real nice affinity, limestone and carbonates. And some of us remember uh, some of the uh, early work on fringing atolls that form around. Carbonates grow up. So real uh, history here. The other thing we wanted to share with you is that not only is Hawaii very distant from a lot of plate boundary activity, but it is affected by the ring of fire. And anytime there's an earthquake anywhere in the Pacific Ocean, Hawaii feels it. And so there's a real uh, uh, alertness to uh, tsunamis, because in Hawaii's history, uh, activity over from uh, the northwest U.S. takes about five miles to get to Hawaii, uh, maybe 10 hours for some of the activity. If, some, if there's an earthquake down in South America, it takes 10 hours or and somewhere in between over here. So just uh, very, very important. And because it's so far from land, it's also a great place as the islands go through their weathering stages uh, they're really isolated from a lot of um, birds and things. So it's a real place for speciation. So if you thought looking at the Galapagos over here was really exciting for Darwin uh, because it was isolated, there were a lot of species that were much closer. So Hawaii really is a great laboratory for people that are interested in plants and animals. So if you take this uh, long 3,900 mile chain, and superimpose it to the United States, you can see this is a very, very uh, significant long chain. We're broadcasting here, I believe we are. Okay, let's move ahead. And we'll just do these quickly oh. because we want you to have a sense of place. So here is the same uh, seamount that we were just looking at with the, the relative plate motion. But here's what we're going to focus on today. So these are the Hawaiian islands that are above sea level, the ones uh, Kauai, Oahu, Molokai, Maui. And there's a series of volcanoes that form the big island of Hawaii. So that's what we're going to look at. And just for fun, there's an up and coming new island called Lohi that's about 3,000 feet below the surface. And in a couple of tens of thousands of years, it'll be the new kid on the block. It'll be the next big island. It just hasn't, it's underwater right now, so it hasn't broken the surface. So that, as the hotspot moves at uh, about one kilometer per 10,000 years, uh, as the plate moves over the hotspot, new islands are constantly being formed. We will get everybody the full photos in the office. And okay. So the game plan for today is here are the islands, as Linda showed you, that are above water. Here is from the hot spot right here on the south end of Hawaii to Kauai, which is the oldest island at about 5 million years. The big island, believe it or not, is a very young island, about 700,000 years or less in geologic time. That's really just yesterday. Um, that This plate has been moved. Here's the hot spot right here where we're going to see the active volcanoes, where Lohi is. And it's you can see that the plate is moving pretty quickly, one kilometer every 10,000 years. So the game plan is we're going to do a helicopter overflight here. We're going to fly, get a good look at Mauna Loa, which is the biggest, but not the tallest. It's a relic volcano, still, uh, still, smoking. still smoking, but uh, somewhat dormant. Kilauea is where we're going to see all the active growth, lots of slumping, lots of lava. Uh, then we're going to fly over on the rainy side of the island and see Hilo, which has got a lot of agriculture because of all the rain. And we're going to see good looks of Mauna Kea, where the telescopes are, as Linda mentioned. We'll see this coastline. And then Kohala is one of the oldest volcanoes on the big island. It's about uh, 700,000 years. This is old in the north and new in the south because of the plate motion. We're going to see some beautiful incised valleys that are weathered in waterfalls and then back to Kona. <laughs> Who doesn't like helicopters? We like helicopters. I think helicopters are fun. So whoop, I'll just go back to just introduce some important people on the helicopter tour. So you'll recognize uh, Larry Jones there. 
He's a HGS supporter. Oops, there's my helicopter tour. There we go. And then uh, Bill Barrett, the big APG supporter. So they only take about six people in the pilot on these uh, helicopters, Bell helicopters. And I got to sit up front. You'll see me. Charles was in the back. I got to sit up front because I had the video camera. And then we're going to, this is from the flight plan. I took a picture of it before we took off. So they had several helicopters in the air at one time at this company it's called Paradise Helicopters. And so this just shows that they always monitor where their helicopters are. And I took a picture of this before we took off. So like Charles said, we're going to go very over the uh, active but somewhat dormant tall volcano of Mauna Loa over to see Kilauea out to the coastline to see lava hitting the ocean, back to Hilo, waterfalls up here, and back to uh, the helicopter base. And just remember, these volcanoes are shield volcanoes, so they just build up with lots and lots of flows. They're not very silica-rich. They're tholeitic, and so they tend to be low stratiform buildups that are not that explosive. This is a cool diagram. Uh, that shows the ages of some of the flows. So as the next uh, footage flies over Mauna Loa, we're looking at some of the flows date from uh, 1949. Some of them say 1851. And on this side of the island, they're in the early 1900s. As we fly over, Kilauea is active right now. Uh, this is the part where the roads are getting covered by modern lava. You see 1969 to 74. We're going to visit... Uh, the Hawaii Volcanoes National Park and see a 1969 lava flow, 50 years old. But there's active, you know, volcanism right here. So when we fly over in the helicopter, notice that the flows have a linearity. There are some fractures. So as the new lava is flowing at Kilauea, it's slumping down the island with a lot of fault scarps. And the fractures concentrate the lava flows. And you'll see a lot of fumaroles kind of all lined up. So keep an eye out for some of those fault scarps. Here we are in the air. There's a, Everybody's comfortably strapped in. There I am with my video camera ready to take a picture. So here we are coming on to the, I guess, uh, early 1940s lava flows out of Mauna Loa. And you can see how much they look like braided streams. There's a, And it has the active sulfuric color there. There you see the helicopter's shadow across the screen there. Cinder cones. Cinder cones. Now this, you know, this is a sulfuric detritus on the surface. And this is just, you feel like you're in the Martian territory. I mean, th this you could think that you're on the surface of Mars here. Because like Mars, this is a basalt. And like Mars, you have these uh, iron minerals that are weathering in the atmosphere on the top of Mauna Loa. So that, that is not snow, that is minerals from the vents. So here's a nice tracking shot. We're coming up onto some, uh, it looks like an old caldera on top of Mauna Loa. And oh, look at the crack here. So here's the Mauna Loa volcano. Now, I think the Mauna Loa volcano is about 12,000 feet. And Mauna Kea, the one with the telescopes, is 13,700 feet. But one of the features of these shield volcanoes is they crack. And so just like on other planets, on Mars or whatever, you see the cracks and you see the old cinder cone up here. And as we move along, we're going to see it's still kind of smoking up there. And the Park Service used to let people come up here hiking. And when we were there, they were not doing that. Uh, There's a lot of gases that come out and some people had been injured by the gases and also they just don't know where the volcano is really active, and they decided it's just too risky to let people hike up here. So helicopters are the way to see Mauna Loa. Here we go. Here's some nice uh, sulfuric materials out on top of the mountain. Oh, and there, okay, we got a smoker there. So here's a, a good chance I had to capture some of the escaping gases from that crack. You can see the yellow sulfur deposits in addition to the white. So 
So, you know, also looks similar to what people see at the bottom of the ocean with the mid-ocean ridges where they have, you know, cracks underneath the water in the Atlantic where they get the smokers. But this is up at uh, 12,000 feet. So just a really desolate landscape. So our, our pilot's now taking us down. I think a map's going to pop up here. We've left Mauna Loa here, and we're taking a pretty smooth helicopter ride. I mean, this was not bumpy. And if you get to Hawaii, I think it was fun to go on the helicopter. So here, here's a, our path. We went over these 1949 uh basalt lava flows, and now we're heading down to the Kilauea, which is a, a round volcanic crater with active lava in it. And, and then this is where Hawaii Volcano National Park is all along here. So this is, again, um, run by the National Park Service. Uh, it's I don't remember there being much of an entrance charge, but you know you do have to get your permit to come in here. And uh, there's a lot of ups, uh, exciting video up ahead here. Let's go look at the Kilauea Volcanic Crater. And ah, whoa. Okay, so you know this always puzzles geologists: is this a meteorite impact or is this a volcano? If you've ever been to Barringer Crater out in Arizona, the controversy raged because they look so similar. I mean, but obviously the case of uh, this has got to be a volcanic crater. It's got the center cone in the. It's got the build up in the center, and of course it's smoking smoking uh, lava. But if it was extinct. You can tell how people can discuss the origins because it is round and it looks quite a bit like an impact crater. But no, this is a good, we're going to take a nice view. And then later on in our program, we're going to go to the Kilauea Visitor Center and see it on the ground. So Kilauea is, is active today and you can see some of the flows uh, coming out the side. You can see a little bit of the lava there. But when we go to the visitor center, we're going to get a much better and more stable look. Our helicopter pilot was sort of trying to circle. I guess I got one of the better views. Some people in the back said they had trouble seeing Kilauea. He didn't want to spend a whole lot of time there. He wanted to get down to the coast and show us the active lava entering the ocean. We got a very good view of that. But, you know, okay, so here we're flying along the Kilauea coast, and the basalt looks like rivers. And you see a road that has been covered by lava, and the Park Service has to keep on covering it. So, you know, this is a – we're flying along the coastline down here. Did you want to make any comment? Yes, look at the, the punching of the topographic contours. So you may have noticed from that last image that there is a slump, uh, a break in slope there. So when we go back to the helicopter, if you take a good look at that, and notice how the flow is just – flow right over that, those slumps. And there's various stages of, and dating to the slumps from, it looks like 1983 uh, to current. This, so look at the way the lava just pours uh, right over the slumps. And it, and it continues over the road as well. And you know, if there's enough time, the, the trees will grow on top of it because volcanic soil is very fertile. So Given a little bit of break between volcanic flows, you know, we have uh, the trees growing on top of it. And then now this is a nice shot here. So, you know, when lava is molten, it acts a lot like water in the, the geomorphic patterns as it flows down to the ocean. So let's go ahead here. It looks like a distributary channel. And Linda, you were mentioning trees. There's actually a place down in these uh, where there's uh, fossilized trees where they got encased in the lava. So that's something that you can uh, walk out and see and touch. Okay, so as we flew out to the ocean, what, what we're seeing here is just like up on Mauna Loa, but this is down near the Kilauea crater. You have active, uh, you know, the lava is interacting with the ocean, the water, and it's making steaming vents. So this was pretty exciting, getting a little bit of rain on the windows here. I just put this picture in. They don't let people go up and look at the uh, molten lava anymore in the Park Service, just like hiking in Mauna Loa. It's just a little too dangerous. So here's a picture. If you get a private tour with a guide and they'll take you out on the fields and you can see molten lava coming out, 
near the edge of the Hawaii coastline. So I, I, we did not get a chance to do that. It's quite a hike. So, and it's very hard. You need an off-road vehicle to get there. So they were saying like four mile hike in to see live lava and uh, did not happen for us. So uh, we did enjoy the helicopter view. So now we're going to go up and look at the fumarole. Here, we, okay. So now we're going to go down on the coastline right here. And so see all that white gas? Okay, that is active lava going into the Pacific Ocean. And in, he really spent some time, our helicopter pilot circled around here, so we get some very three-dimensional shots. Uh, this is the part that's difficult to walk out here, the four-mile hike to get out here. So, you know, it's, very, it's good to see by boat, and it's really exceptional to see by helicopter. So underneath this fume, this, it's actually just water vapor, is uh, 365 days a year, uh, 24 hours a day, there is no stop. It pours lava into the ocean, and it creates this enormous steam column, which is visible from an airplane. If you're in a commercial airliner and you're flying over, you can, if you know where to look, you'll see this. It's visible from a helicopter, obviously, and I think it's sometimes I think they can see it from space. It's an enormous plume of steam, and it's just emanating right now from a particular vent. But I think over you know longer periods of time, the vent moves around a little bit. So right now it's creating like a lava beach down there in the ocean. And of course, Hawaii is beautiful. Uh, it's really a treasure to to be even be able to vacation there. It's, it's one of the most beautiful places. Yeah, I think Charles pointed out the road got covered by that lava. So this would be extremely uh, modern lava, like in the last 20 years or so. Let's go on to the yeah, next Yeah, so shot. if you look in the upper left of the uh, view, there's a road, but notice how all of a sudden yeah. it, it's covered by lava flows. We didn't actually see any l lava on the surface, so there's a lot of lava tubes that deliver the lava to the water that are just just below the surface of the lava the hardened lava so now we're going away from the ocean and we're heading to the very populated city of hilo hawaii uh hilo is the probably the bigger town on the big island it's one with the most restaurants they grow a lot of things they do have a geothermal plant over in near hilo <laughs> along the puna coast and they make advantage of all that hot water coming up from the volcano. So the Big Island of Hawaii is a powered green. It has both solar power and it has a very large and productive geothermal plant that generates electricity for people in the island. So they're blessed by, you know, only needing to bring in petroleum for cars. And, of course, getting gas is really expensive in Hawaii. It's like double what it is here in the U.S. They don't. So getting gasoline is expensive. So there's Mauna Kea, the taller island. It doesn't have any snow on it now. We're going to visit that by Jeep at the end of our trip. But in our helicopter, we got a, a shot of it. Can't see the telescope installation up there, but uh, we'll get back to that after our helicopter ride is over. So now we're going to go up the, the Kilauea coast, which is really very green. And you can see there's no sandy beaches out here. We're north of Hilo. We're heading uh, on the eastern and northeastern end of the island. As Linda mentioned, it's the rainy part of the island. It's about 150 inches of rain a year. Kona, which is the west side, dry side of the island, is about 10 or 15 inches per year. So a real dramatic difference. So this region is heavily agriculture. They have a lot of farms, a lot of um, uh, local food. It's, uh, you know, grown right there. Now we're going up to the north end of the island, the older volcanic area that Charles said called Kahala. And that's known for its beautiful hanging waterfalls. And so this is erosion from the top of the old volcano, uh, making some very spectacular green valleys. I um, mean, the only other place I, I, we went to was New Zealand many years ago, and they have hanging valleys like this. 
So now I don't, there are places to vacation in the Kahala Coast, but as we flew up the valleys, it seemed really uninhabited. So you can't really go over land to get here. The only way to get to these side of these black beaches is by boat or by boat <laughs> <laughs> and fly by a helicopter because there's no paths to like go over the mountains and go down the beach. So there's sort of a pristine wonderland of paradise. I mean, I'm sure any animals or plants are all very uh, happy that people aren't uh, interacting with them. And so we uh, we were happy to be able to get this uh, view. As you come up the coastline, there's just numerous hanging waterfalls coming off the top. So remember, this is the rainy side of the island. So where does the water come from? Well, it comes from the daily nonstop rain that uh, is on the island on the on the Pacific side. And our helicopter pilot was playing music for us while we went in, but I didn't turn the music on. There's a famous Hawaiian singer called Iz, and he has a Hawaiian last name, and he sings Over the Rainbow, which is really a wonderful rendition, a Hawaiian banjo-sounding rendition of Over the Rainbow. And after you hear that, you go out and buy his, his albums. Well, there's so many rainbows here because notice all the uh, waterfalls. There's a lot of V cuts. They're young, uh, as Linda said, because of the rain, they're cutting down, and a lot of hanging waterfalls. And they tend to produce absolutely gorgeous rainbows. So it's an appropriate place. This is why I love helicopters because no plane can get you as a tourist as close as the helicopter boat. So I felt like we were right up against those hanging waterfalls. And hearing the music, it was really very memorable. And I want to thank our helicopter pilot. He was pretty good. Uh, you know, he they usually run about four trips a day around the island, always on that same path. So he gets to see this beautiful thing about uh, three or four times a day. Okay, now we're heading back out to the coast. There's a extinct cinder cone. If you were wondering what those valleys were, that is Waipio Valley. So they were those big, broad valleys that you can fly into. Okay. Well, we're moving along with our program. Now we're going to visit Kilauea Crater in Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. And so we were on a guided bus tour with the APG Foundation. And the author of the book we recommend is Chuck Blay, who lives in Kauai, and he's a geologist. And... Uh, I got the impression more retired than not, but uh, he put a lot of work into this book, and you can get it on Amazon.com. We want to credit him. It was a great trip. Um, a lot of our friends in California have been on other trips with him, highly recommended. Uh, he's a great geology professor, publishes. Uh, if you look him up online, if you're interested in learning more about Hawaii, he's, he's, a, he's a great resource. So, you know, when we went to the Halalema Uma Overlook, that's sort of the, one of the <laughs> names of the god goddess Pele, who they say controls the creator, and you have to make her happy, or else, like, lava will belch out. So that was Charles looking back over the creator. And, you know, Western people discovered the creator in 1928. Of course, the native people knew about it for centuries, but the West more or less discovered it in 2008. And at that time, the whole crater floor was full of molten lava. And since then, it's retreated quite a bit to just be these little hot spots in the back. <clears throat> this is the same crater that you saw when we flew over the, in the overflight. It's just we got a more stable picture of it. And I think we're going to cut in. Uh, this is an interactive diagram here showing, you know, what the crater looks like, but we're going to cut in some USGS footage that Charles found right after this shot that shows a time lapse of what the activity on the crater floor at Kilauea. This is just sort of an average day here. Here was a special day in uh, February 9th of 2005. <coughs> Here's the time lapse. Uh, we're going to see basically a day and a night, a single day and a night. Uh, at very active time of lava flow. And you can see the light, the dark darkness of light really highlights the, um, the, the fire glow. Okay, well I see we're getting some chat questions. 
Hey, Alyssa, thank you, Alyssa, for helping us with chat. Do you want to read any of the chat questions here, if we have time to take any? Okay, we'll do that at the end. And then is say, somebody's saying that Charles' voice is modeled. Is, is it better now, or does he just have to get closer to the screen? Okay, well, let's go ahead here with the rest of it. Sounds like you have to talk up a little bit. Yeah, back to uh, 2016, you can still see the activity of the lava coming into the floor of the crater. I think in our next video, we have a time lapse of the crater floor. I think it's coming up right here. Mm -hmm. You can kind of see the, the surging of the, the lapping of the orange waves of lava. Now, this is a two and a half year time lapse over some peak activity from 2004 to 2006. And you kind of see it inflating. You see things huffing and puffing. You see individual flows. And boy, look at that volcanic neck form. Yeah, you pay attention to this neck because when we go to the Volcano National Park and we look at 50-year-old lava, you're going to see the relic necks there. So here's one that's forming in 2005. And then it seems, it seems like it just cannibalizes itself later and just falls into the caldera. USGS has a great series of videos. So if you look up uh, USGS in Hawaii, there's some great things that you can uh, learn about and download. So right near Kilauea, there's a lava tube you can go inside. And so we're, we'll point out, I think the arrow comes on here. So the lava tubes are pretty close to the Kilauea. And uh, we're going to go down the entrance. So Charles, how does this form? It's really interesting. We looked at how lava forms, and of course, where it's the it's super hot as it's flowing, but around the edges it cools first, much like uh, rivers do when they're in, surrounded in really super cold conditions. So the center part continues to flow, but the edges solidify, and in time, the edges, which is open to the air, continue to grow over the top and then form a, a tube. And when that happens, boy, you've got a chamber for super hot fluids to, to flow through. And um, these things transmit a lot of hot lava. So, you know, unlike a traditional cave where maybe a wa river's in, this is, was once filled with hot, mag hot lava where the people were walking here and a little bit of air pocket space. And it's about a thousand feet long. There was one corner where they invited you to go into a dead end, way down the end, but that, there were no lights in there. It was a flashlight only. So we just, uh, I think it's kind of spooky in here. Uh, so I was kind of ready at the end of a thousand feet to get out of here. But they do give you flashlights when you go in. And this part is has some electrical lighting. But uh, what it's not stalactites and stalagmites. Now that's just hanging moss on the top there. And it's a little bit wet. Things are dripping on you. But uh, you can go underground and an exit at the end. So the lava just sort of flew, ended its flow and stopped flowing. And the air hardened inside. And then I guess other lava came on top of it and made it into a tube. So now we're going to go to a, a 50-year-old eruption it, it, and we know it was in 1969 because there was a plaque there. And now take a look at the volcanic neck. So remember in the video from the USGS how part of the development of the flow is to have a neck. They look like little duck heads. And what you'll see them everywhere, you know, in this older coal. Now, here's one in the back there. They're just so strange looking. And I know, oops, okay, I just wanted to show you again. Look at the head, see? See how it forms the, the head? It's part of the formation of the bulk, the lava coming up. And then in this case, it cannibalizes itself. But in this case on the Mauna Ula Trail from 1969, you can still see these very weird, kind of like you're at Easter Island with strange heads and everything. 
uh, you know, left over from the volcanic eruption and lots of molten rock. You know, the Apollo astronauts came out and trained in Big Island. And I think it was one of the sites to test the lunar rover because the type of rocks here are, you know, like they're very glass rich. So you could test the tires and make sure that everything would be sturdy for a moon trip. And here we see one of the collapsed uh, calderas from 1969. And life is everywhere. It's still trying to grow, trying to get at this trying to get a foothold into the lava, you know, there you can see some little plants trying to grow in the, in the fissure cracks. It's very light. Like you could stuff your pockets with this. It's like just tough, you know, old, like a pumice and extremely light and very shiny. There's another one of these strange duck heads left behind. Light but also sharp and crunchy when you walk on it. So quite the lunar landscape experience, except if you could – Pretend there's no plants there growing in it. This must be exactly what it's like to walk on the craters of the moon. We'll ask Jack next week. Yeah. A great place to train, you know, future astronauts for Mars and for uh, the moon. Mana Ulu, H.A. Trail. So I just cut in some pictures that we took so you can see some really interesting uh, lava patterns. And of course, the Hawaiians have names for all of it, uh, you know, whether it's Pohoi Hoi or, you know, another another name. But uh, we just took some pictures of some really plasticky looking flows. Now, here's a fun thing we're going to do. We're going to go up to the Mauna Kea summit. You got to have a four wheel drive to get up there. We were all prepared. In this Google Earth vision, you could see that there's 10 uh, installations of different telescopes. They're both optical and infrared. It's an international project. It was started in the, in the late 60s. I'll just stop here. Uh, the first installations was the University of Hawaii. And when we get to the parking lot, you'll see some of the older optical telescopes. And the newer installations, they look a sub-millimeter refers to looking at the infrared part of the spectrum when you're taking uh, photographies and readings of the sky, the James Clerk Maxwell, and they have the twin towers that uh, I think they, these, these Keck Observatory are two twin towers you'll see, and I think they work together to build an image. Uh, I think that the Maxwell telescope has seen some sort of galaxy 14 billion years old up here. So this the it's a bit of a drive to get up here because it's extremely steep on the ascent. So that's why they recommend that you rent a, a four wheel drive beach, uh, jeep. It doesn't start out that uh, that steep, but when you get to about here, it's you'll need a four wheel drive. This would wear a car out. So initially we got we got our jeep from uh, the rental place, and we went up to the Anazuka Center which is at 9,000 feet. Now you can get up to the Anazuka Center in a regular car. So don't think you need a Jeep to get this far, but you're not at the difficult part at the Anazuka Center. And they have some displays, but basically they recommend that if you're going to the top at 13.7 and you're coming from sea level, that you just sort of stay here for 90 minutes and see how you feel and don't eat a whole lot. So we followed all their instructions. We only had a sandwich. We stayed here for 90 minutes, but I felt like I didn't really feel any kind of altitude problem. So I was eager to get up there. The sunset was going to be, you know, at seven o'clock. So our plan was that we were going to stop back down at the Anazuka Center because they were going to have a nighttime astronomy. But we're just going to go up and see the sunset on the top of the of Mauna Kea. So then we, I think the next picture show us ascending up to the top. Mm -hmm. With any of the high ascents in the thin oxygen, you have to stay hydrated. And the preparation also, as Linda mentioned, is to eat very lightly because you don't want to get lightheaded. And uh, you, we're almost at 14,000, not quite. Yes. Yeah, so as you get up to the top, it takes an hour and you'll probably be putting your vehicle into second gear to get up the last part. Uh, then you get this beautiful sight. This is a panorama of all the telescopes up here. One of the features of being above the clouds in Hawaii is it's very dry. And they tell me that it's the best place to take pictures of the universe and do infrared photography other than the Andes, other than South America. This is the place to go. So obviously... Okay, we 
came up on the four-wheel drive Jeep. We're at around 13,990 something. This is an incredible view. It's about 45 minutes before sunset. Last night we saw the stars in the Milky Way from sea level, so we're really excited about seeing what it looks like up here and then again at the visitor center at 9200 on the way back down. It's 40% up here of what it is at sea level. 40%. Um, this telescope is, is the University of Hawaii's telescope. This is one of the older telescopes. It's optical only. And that's another University of Hawaii telescope. And this is the parking lot where they let the public come up. The deal is that they don't want you to go into the observatories. Those are only for researchers. There's the twin tech telescopes and the Subaru telescope. But they like the public to come up to see the sunset. So you're welcome to do that. Many tours were up here. We came up as individuals. There's no charge. There's no fees. There's no help. There's no... <laughs> You know, there's no food there. You know, you're on your own. So I think they I think they had facilities, but basically they're not going to help you unless you're in distress up here. So I belong to the Houston Astronomical Society. That's a, a telescope. I think in the next place, it's the Hawaii 2.2 meter telescope was the one that was closest to us in the parking lot. And that's the Subaru telescope and the two twin Keck 1 and Keck 2 telescopes. So here's the crowd. I like this lady with the shorts here. Uh, you, they told us it was going to be 40 degrees, so we piled all kinds of coats into the car. It really, this particular day was only about 60 degrees. It wasn't that cold. We were a little overdressed, but people, are, what they're looking for is they're waiting for the sun to go down in the west. Quite a bit of a moon-like landscape. You know, it's 13,700 feet. I did not feel any problem. It does affect some people. So they have, you know, advice if you feel like it's air's too thin for you. Personally, I did not have a problem. Uh, but we did not exert ourselves too much. We just sort of stood and looked at the most beautiful sunset I can remember with its gorgeous telescopes and how much fun it must be to be a researcher there, you know, to be able to research the heavens on top of Mauna Kea. Now it's getting, the sun's going down. And then uh, they kind of encourage you that to uh, leave. They don't want you to set up a personal telescope up there. You can do that down at the Anazuka Center. So, you know, person comes out, says it's time to go, go back down to uh, 9,200 feet. Easier drive down than up, that's for sure. But I uh, see the cloud bank. It was actually raining in Hilo when we went back that night. So, but we were, we did stop at the Anazuka Center and saw, this isn't a picture I took, this is, but this is what it looked like, and absolutely out of this world skies, and it's 365 days a year, not like Houston where you have to wait for a clear night, of course the moon would affect the, the skies, but we had a beautiful night at the Anazuka Center, and they had people out showing uh, the, the skies and, you know, some of the clusters. I had some nice binoculars, so it was really very memorable. Just a short personal story. The thing that I remember most is the Andromeda Galaxy. Mm -hmm. So we can see it here in Houston with binoculars, and it's bigger. It's, you know, you get a sense that it's bigger than just the cluster, that it has, you know, dust lanes and other but up here it was huge we don't have a picture of it here but the milky way um or excuse me andromeda galaxy was just the largest that i've ever seen it it was just you could see the uh, galactic arms and i've never seen it anywhere else like that this is the end of our presentation here